Australia is suffering from a dreadful bushfire season, arguably the worst on record. At the same time, ideologues on both sides are flapping their arms about and blaming each other. What's fact and what's fake on the Australian bushfires? Let's discuss. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Like you, I would expect, I've been hearing all the stories from Australia over the last few weeks with real dismay, especially over the lives and the homes lost. Likewise, the devastation that the fires have brought to the wildlife of the Australian bush, and even wider with the huge populations breathing in dangerous air, which has just gone off the scale in recent weeks. The focus should be supporting the people who are fighting the fires, bringing them under control and saving lives, as well as the 27 people at the time of recording who have actually lost their lives. I know there have been several deaths amongst the firefighters in the course of protecting their communities. Those are the people whose service and sacrifice should be the main focus of attention. If you haven't done so already and you want to donate to support the firefighters, I include links in the video description for this video. I think it's fair to say that the debate around these fires has been particularly angry. As far as some people are concerned, the bushfires are caused by climate change. Prime Minister Scott Morrison is personally responsible because he once brandished a lump of coal. And if you suggest that there are any other possible causes, that is akin to you being a climate denier. On the other side, some people have reacted to all of that saying that, on the contrary, it's the Greens who are to blame because they prevented sensible burning in advance and even, according to some, actively abetted the fires so that they could be blamed on climate change. Others, for whom these standard ideological positions are just too ooh, mainstream, are spreading the conspiracy theory that lasers and exploding smart meters are being used to start bushfires to make the way for a new train network. And you can add to that the people that claim any event like this is all down to the UN Agenda 21 programme to depopulate the world. You think this is a pretty ineffective way to achieve that, but apparently thousands of people online are lapping it up. It's all getting pretty wild. So let's focus in on some facts. According to a recent report, Australia is the most fire-prone continent and country on Earth, with an average of 54,000 bushfires every year. That's a huge number. But hardly a surprise, given the continent's long-established history of extreme weather, including extended hot and dry temperatures during the summer. Therefore, bushfires have come every year. And up to a point, they've been a good thing, because they help to maintain biodiversity and help many species to survive. That only takes you so far, however. Obviously, when things get completely out of balance, we go well past the scale where the effect is beneficial. Needless to say, that's exactly where we are this year. So the question isn't so much why are there bushfires, they happen every year. The question is why have we ended up with the worst episode in recent times and what can we do to prevent it in the future? Let's start with what causes these fires. A study by the Australian Institute of Criminology in 2008 suggested that 13% of bushfires were deliberately started, 35% were accidental, 37% were suspicious, 6% were natural, 5% resulted from a reignition of a previous fire, and 4% was other. No idea what other might be in this context. I suppose it could be landing alien spaceships, but it's only 4%, so we won't worry about it too much. A 2015 satellite analysis of 113,000 fires through the period of 1997 to 2009 suggested that 40% of fires were deliberately lit and another 47% accidental. The conclusion between both overall then is that about 85% of these fires are human caused. That's reasonably consistent. It's a measure of how polarised this will become even facts like this get seized upon, politicised and batted backwards and forwards. Some campaigners have rejected such information as misleading because their position is that climate change is far and away the biggest cause of all of this. Others have been exaggerating figures about the numbers of arrests of arsonists as a way of attemptedly minimising the role of climate change. As I often say, ideologically minded people often filter the facts to fit their ideology. As far as I can see from the data, there's no reason to believe that the percentage involved in these bushfires are significantly different to previous years. 
And the season isn't worse because more fires have been lit. What's made it worse is that especially dry and hot conditions have made the fires more severe and faster to spread than has been the case in recent years. And this, of course, is where, if climate change is to be implicated, is where it will be. Not everyone accepts that it should be. For one thing, bad bushfire seasons are not unprecedented, neither is hot drought. One of the worst was the Black Saturday fires of 2009. These saw 173 deaths, 430,000 hectares burnt, which included 51 towns, 78 communities and 2,129 homes lost. Before then, there were the Ash Wednesday bushfires in February 1983, it's been pointed out that for those previous fires, terrible as they were, the period of emergency was far less, with the main focus hitting single days, hence the names given to them. Whereas the current event has been ongoing for a much longer period. And that is, of course, true. And you might say as well, well, both of those have happened in a later period where climate change could have been a factor anyway. But then there have been around 21 significant bushfire seasons since 1950 and plenty more before then as well. 1851 and 1939 were two of the largest ones before, for instance. The Black Saturday fire was preceded by the worst drought on record, lasting over a decade. A 2009 paper identified that one of the significant factors was what's called a positive Indian dipole event. These events come about because of warmer than usual temperatures in the western Indian Ocean region and cooler than usual temperatures in the east. And the rainfall tends to move with the warm waters. And this means that you see heavier rainfalls over East African countries and droughts in Southeast Asia and Australia. There was a strong dipole towards the end of last year. And the paper noted that such dipole events preceded both the Black Saturday fires and the Ash Wednesday fires, Overall, 11 out of the 21 most significant bushfire seasons. Now, according to some, dipole events may become more frequent or more extreme due to continuing climate change. At the moment, looking at the recent dipole record, there's no specific accelerating trend visible in recent years. That doesn't mean that one won't emerge. One thing that does look rather trend-like, however, is the temperature records for Australia. Here's a medley of maps produced by the Bureau of Meteorology which definitely draws the eye to the latter years. The average rainfall anomaly in Australia looks pretty balanced. In fact, more wetter anomalies in recent years than drier ones. However, that's because this is for the whole of the continent. And the wetter trend is very much northern Australia. If we look to the east, where we've been seeing the bushfires, you can see that the trends are markedly different. And going back to those temperatures, both for north and for east, those trends are pretty solidly in place. There's been a decline of winter rainfall in the southwest, and some have linked that to climate change specifically. There is some decline as well in the southeast, although it is much more difficult to distinguish from the natural variability. So look, this is the point of it. The campaigners are not wrong to say that more climate change will mean more of the sorts of extremes that have exacerbated this season's fires. But there are other factors, and having talked about the positive Indian dipole events, we haven't even touched upon the El Nino phenomenon, amongst others, which are also regular factors. So those campaigners that say this year is all to do with climate change are wrong. It's more complicated than that, even though they do at least have an accurate prediction they can point to. A time when lots of people have been posting examples of rubbish predictions about what would happen in 2020 or by 2020, this one stood up pretty well. The Garno Climate Change Review's final report said projections of fire weather suggest that fire seasons will start earlier, end slightly later and generally be more intense. This effect increases over time but should be directly observable by 2020. Nice bit of timing there, but one example of the predicted behaviour in the targeted year doesn't make it into a trend. Nevertheless, none of this justifies those campaigners that are running around flapping their arms in the air, shouting about how the world is on fire and this is the disintegration of the fabric of society happening right here. Campaigners are too ready 
to jump onto every extreme weather event and to say it's definitely climate change, which only works if you can disregard all of the other historical events that have likewise been awful. Some people who should know better have been prepared to do similar. Climate scientist Michael Mann, who happens to be in Australia, wrote along those lines for the Guardian newspaper. The brown skies I observed in the Blue Mountains this week are a product of human-caused climate change. It's not complicated. He then turned that assertion into a political statement. Australians must vote out fossil fuel politicians who have chosen to be part of a problem and vote for climate champions who are willing to solve it. I get people in the comment sections of my videos peddling nonsense about Michael Mann's former work on climate change, particularly the so-called hockey stick. Nevertheless, he is now one of those figures that has become a campaigner first and a scientist second. The lack of nuance in his attribution in this specific instance to climate change when the rest of the published literature is not with him indicates the problem of that whole dynamic. Campaigning scientists are not necessarily wrong, but their assessment of the science needs to be actively cross-referenced with literature from less ideologically minded colleagues, especially when they cross the line into political partisanship. Now, on the one hand, I understand why they're going so hard at it. They lost the election that was supposed to be theirs to win. And if they feel that Scott Morrison is vulnerable and these recent events can be used to highlight why the country made a huge mistake, it's a pretty natural political campaign play. The people on the other side would do exactly the same if the positions were reversed. But we still have to focus on the practicality of what to do. And the point is that the immediate answer to these fires is not to reduce your carbon emissions over the long term, is to all get out together and help put the fires out and then deal practically with steps to avoid similar scale of fires in the future. Both sides have given the appearance of riding their cause on the back of a lot of tragic events in order to make their point. And that sense hasn't been improved by the barrage of fake news that has, ironically, spread like wildfire across the internet. Like this picture which I hope we all know by now to have been a montage produced of a month's worth of fires with the intensity not fully representative of how they actually looked, rather than what a lot of people believed it to be, which was a photograph taken by NASA of Australia seen from space. And it's also been fake to suggest that all the fires are the fault of the Greens by banning backburning and hazard reduction because the Greens are not in power, they never have been, so they can't be to blame for policies and how they're enforced. There have been certain protests by green-minded people against certain areas of hazard reduction in Victoria, for instance. They did this on the grounds that spring burning has a particularly heavy toll on nesting birds and the like. They're not wrong about those consequences. But equally, these fires have spread like crazy because the ground is completely tinder dry and the temperatures are hot. A few places where rather limited burns were prevented are not thought to have been much of a factor in the huge conflagrations we've seen in the last month. Mind you, having said that, I expect a lot of those Greens will think very carefully before undertaking the same process in the future. Unintended consequences, people. I keep talking about them, boring though it may be. So what about those practical policies? The Australian Academy of Science picked up on this theme in its recent statement, where it said this, as a nation, we must deal with extreme weather events more effectively than we currently do. As such events become more frequent and severe, we must adapt Australia and Australians accordingly, as well as strengthen mitigation efforts. And it went on to add, everything including urban planning, building standards, habitat restoration, biodiversity and species preservation, and land, water and wildlife management will need careful and measured consideration. The question is, what sort of resources are needed? What sort of management practices would make a difference? And how do we crack the challenge of the people who choose to light fires, who are often youngsters? Clearly, firefighting and prevention is something that can be given a higher priority. Scott Morrison's pledged an extra two billion to fire services to deal with the crisis, but this comes against a backdrop of criticism that the services had not been sufficiently funded before, indeed had been run down. As things currently stand, some states have significant regulations preventing property owners from carrying out their own controlled hazard reduction burns. As for sort of red tape or maybe green tape, that should be given some hard examination. I'm just reminded that when you look at how many people die from natural disasters worldwide, the number has plummeted in recent decades. 
Not because natural disasters happen any less frequently, but because in countries that are the most susceptible, improvements to infrastructure and policies have made them massively less lethal when they do. If Bangladesh can do that with hurricanes and the like, then surely Australia can manage something similar on wildfires. Which is, of course, why I've said before in these videos that I don't see that the number of wildfires is a good indicator of climate change or anything else, because smart and well-resourced adaptation may not be able to reduce the incidence of fires, but it must be able to ensure that this sort of out-of-control result doesn't happen again. According to a recent scientific study, the influence of climate change in fires has so far only been detected in around 22% of the world's burnable land area, including the Amazon, Mediterranean, Scandinavia and Western North America. It does not include Siberia or Australia. Indeed, it doesn't expect it to be a factor for Australia until the 2040s. And even that depends on the extreme case scenario RCP 8.5, widely believed now to be too extreme to be representative of what's actually happening. So you could probably push that back for another decade at least. The study concludes detection and attribution of global fire activity to anthropogenic climate change is confounded by influences of other anthropogenic activities such as land cover change, population and fire suppression, as well as temporarily limited satellite based fire records. Global data shows there has been a reduction in burned area in recent years as a result of the clearing of natural land for agriculture. In the meantime, the way the debate is conducted should be respectful to those that have been traumatised by what's happened to themselves and to their homes and their communities. The fighting will come soon enough, not least by all accounts, between the Prime Minister and his own party hardliners if he's moved to shift on climate policy in the wake of this high-profile moment of truth. Anyway, that's all I have for now. As always, links to scientific papers and other references are given in the video description. And again, links are given also in the video description below for donations to the Australian firefighters. Please consider giving if you haven't already. Mm -hmm.